I love the flowers behind you. Uh, the recording is in progress of Women Matters of ah, the end of March. We are almost in April. And we thought today to talk about caring because it seems to be a feminine trait of caring. And I think all of us, we like to do it. Many of us are coaches or something like this, psychologists and taking care for other people. And the question is, how far is caring uh, a healthy thing to do? And when do we exaggerate? And then it becomes something not so healthy, neither for us, maybe, nor for other people. And before we do that, we do the normal check-in. And I start with Haneli. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I'm Jan Janice Bixter, and I'm looking forward to go down to Cape Town next week. I'd really love I haven't been to the beach since uh, COVID so started, so I'm really delighted about that. And just to also travel a little bit again, even if it's locally. And I've been very busy with very interesting things, so I'm really grateful for that. I'm busy publishing a new podcast about resonance alchemy and how it can help us to transmute inequality. And a blog that goes with it, um, doubling up, um, which also just shares another perspective on that. So I'm really excited to share those with the world and um, because it's something that I'm deeply care about as we're now speaking about caring of how we can transmute these dilemmas of humanity. And I'm complete and I'm, I'm um, giving to Christine from the West Coast. <laughs> okay, good morning. I'm uh, speaking from Carlsbad, California. And um, had a nice weekend. We went out to the desert. It's about uh, a little over two hours east of here, go over the mountain and then descend into the desert valley um, where it was very warm. Uh, but we went out to meet my daughter's boyfriend's mother. <laughs> so they're, they're a pretty serious couple and she may be, you know, they're my, my daughter's mother-in-law someday. I don't know. Um, so we met her for the first time and it was lovely. Um, it was very nice, uh, had a wonderful weekend. But um, the painful part, uh, even though I enjoyed myself, that the painful part is I learned again, after, which I have had to learn many times, I guess for some reason it's a lesson I need to learn over and over again, and it may fit into our topic of caring, but I have to always be reminded who I'm married to. So my MO is to be accommodating and try to not assert myself in any strong opinionated way and see what the consensus is of the group and what does everybody want to do. And unfortunately, um, that makes my husband feel like I'm just kind of not available, like I'm not there. And the things he and I talk about, you know, our priorities, I kind of abandon them and I give them up in my effort to be, um, likable or accommodating or whatever. So um, I, I didn't do anything terrible. I mean, I didn't do anything that a lot of people wouldn't have done. But the thing is, I have to keep reminding, I have to keep being reminded by him, you know, what my priorities are and who I'm married to. And it does matter to him. It doesn't matter to me. I'm willing to go with whatever anybody wants to do. Um, but he has stronger preferences than I do. And I tend to push them aside. You know, his preferences, I push them aside in, in my effort to be um, agreeable with everybody. So it was a painful lesson um, to learn yet again. I hope I don't have to learn it too many more times because <laughs> I certainly should know by now. But uh, that part of me keeps coming up and clashing with that part of him. So other than that, it was a great weekend. I will turn it over to Monia. Well, you really got me fascinated, Christine. <laughs> and I would love to delve deeper into that because actually I don't have much to tell. It's spring and uh, yeah, it's just for the first time we're sitting outside having lunch and coffee. And, but, um, how can I put my fingers on it, what you said, Christine? 
so your husband is your first priority. And uh, yeah, maybe we could, after everybody has checked in, go into the topic of caring. That would be quite fascinating. Thank you. I'll pass on to Beatrice, whom I haven't seen in a long time. Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, I don't know, even know how long it's been. I'm a little sick if you hear that in my voice. I'm recovering from a cold. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think of, <laughs> it's been a lot of changes in a while. Um, I think the last time I saw you was before I went on my Florida trip. Um, and uh, that was really wonderful. The wedding was a lot of fun. It was nice to be in warm weather, especially because it was very cold and snowy here at that time. Um, it's actually cold again. We're having bouts of false spring. <laughs> we have a day that's really warm and the next day, it's yesterday, it snowed for a minute. So it's very confusing. Um, anyway, Florida was lovely. And one of the beautiful things that I got to do while I was there was meet um, a woman who, who knew my father in high school when he was a foreign exchange student there for a year in this tiny town in Indiana. And she pulled out um, the yearbook that had a big centerfold all about him because he was the first ever exchange student that they had had. So was, he got an entire centerfold in the book and um, lots of pictures of him at the diner, you know, drinking a milkshake and, you know, in the, the machine shop class and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and then we flipped through the yearbook and found other pictures of him. And she also gave me a stack of letters they had been in correspondence from 1953, which was the year after he left until, well, I thought only until 1993, because that was what the letter she gave me. And then uh, just a, a couple of weeks ago, she sent me a package in the mail of email printouts. So I guess in 1993, they switched to digital communication. So I think they were in communication until he died. Um, so I haven't read, I read the first letter, which was, you know, when he was 18 years old, writing to her for the first time um, after he got back to Austria. Um, I don't know, it was very lovely and it, and it kind of feels connected to the trip I had to Austria in the summer of just reconnecting with my father and his history and his story and his family and chosen family also with this, this woman. Um, so that was exciting. Um, I started a new job um, at my church. I'm helping with their education program and I really, really love it. Um, it's fulfilling in multiple ways. It's fun and it's, it's all, but also has some administrative stuff that I like to do, but also gets to be with children, which I love. Um, and I get to be creative about thinking of um, curriculum and projects. So that's really exciting. Um, and right now I'm in the process of leaving all of the nonprofit jobs, um, which I think was a long time coming and necessary and was really, they were really eating up my life and it was not a, it had become not a healthy situation. Um, and um, so it's really time. So this is my last week. I'm trying to wrap up by the end of this month. Um, really kind of leave things organized um, for them and then um, take a step back. And my hope is that I can spend more time dreaming on my own projects and diving back into my own creative practice and figuring out what I want my future to be and what I can create rather than, you know, just being a cog in someone else's wheel. So that's, those are my updates. Um, yeah. Oh, and my mother wanted, I think she just came, got home. She just wanted, she was listening this whole time. She wanted me to say that she uh, was just on her way home from, from mass and um, will be joining as soon as she's, oh, there she is. <laughs> so she just got home. So I will pass to my mother in California. Thank you. Um, hello, everybody. Great to be back. I've missed you. Um, you. What? I said, good to see you. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Likewise. Um, I don't even remember when I was here last, so um, I don't know how to check in except to say that um, 
I'm glad to be to see you all. And I've been really, um, I've been totally immersed as usual in my, um, I've decided I'm a retreat addict. And um, so I've been immersed in a lot of, <laughs> a lot of Buddhist courses and retreats. They're, they're getting kind of beyond me now because they're getting so high level that I have no clue. They're all the people are like uh, fluent in Sanskrit and Pali and arguing over tiny semantic differences. <laughs> So, um, so I'm trying to pull away from that. Um, I have a, a lecture series coming up in April on Sergei Diaghilev and the Ballet Russe, and um, well, actually on everything about his life. And so I'm trying to now um, sort of change my focus and get back to work. Um, and then in June, I'm playing all the all the works written for violin by Stravinsky um, in connection with the Diaghilev celebration, but also because. Um, Last year I was going to do the concert. It was it was the fiftieth anniversary of Stravinsky's death, but um, because of COVID I couldn't do it. And my pianist just sent me the music um, over the weekend, and it's absolutely terrifying. So <laughs> I have seventy five pages of Stravinsky to learn. Um, so um, what? Hello. Oh, did my sound go off? Mm -hmm. We hear you. Oh, oh. Okay. So um so that's where I am and I'm I'm um so glad to be back. And uh who's I don't know who shared because I was in the car and it was kind of hard to hear. But I'll pass it to what? I can go on yet. Okay, Christine. Um keeping it short. I think I have a subject that has just arisen in the last two days that very much comes under the umbrella of caring as women. So I have a lovely efficiency apartment downstairs, a complete separate entrance on my property. And I usually I haven't really had anybody stay there because I like my privacy, but I have some work that needs to be done. Some really creative gardening work. And I met a man who, uh, is working with a friend of mine and I met him very serendipitously. It was like one of these Fellini movies when everything was kind of coming together. And I thought, I guess we're supposed to meet each other, huh? This was magic. So I arranged for a time for him to stop by and look at the land and look at the efficiency apartment. And um, from a caring place, I spent a lot of time listening to him for three hours down at the creek. and. Um, Afterwards, I thought, hell no, especially when he started to hit on me. He grabbed me and wasn't letting me go. Now, fortunately, he wasn't touching parts of my body that he shouldn't be touching, but he was definitely hitting on me and saying, I could really have more of this if I come and live here and work here. And I thought, Butters, thank you for showing me who you are now. My caring just stopped. <laughs> and so um, I get to send him a text. I'm not even going to call him. I'm just going to say, no, 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 because he was planning this, his life around this. So caring, but with, so my message today as we talk about caring is going to be about being deeply grounded. When, we're, when I'm grounded, I don't waver and start to please somebody else. So that's my story about caring. I've pass it on to Gertrude. Do you have a not gone yet? Have you? No, neither me nor Heidi. Okay. Um, yeah, it's been. Oh yeah, I I have um, <clears throat> with with somebody who who did the WeFlow training with me. Uh, we started a weekend, which was really great. <laughs> so a lot of things happening. Where one uh, wrote a whole song, and another one did a video and posted it, and so it was really like getting all these things done that you postponed for many weeks and months <laughs> um, and and I'm coming out of this weekend like yeah let's do that again and so end April we have the next one 
end, I met a woman uh, who is doing, does anybody know about neurographics? This is my neurographic painting, mm. a drawing. And um, I don't go deep into this, but I had this uh, idea if uh, she might come here and, and just um, have, a, have one hour with us. I don't know if that's, uh, if, so we had two hours for this, but it's really like doing uh, this drawing and, and creating something as you see, as you could see there, like, like ganglions um, and then interpreting. Um, and it was just amazing what happened and how it unfolded. And so, and seeing me doing completely different uh, uh, lines and things than, than she did. And so, yeah. So I got hooked <laughs> to know more about that. Um, yeah, and I'm planning, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about going to the integral conference on site, maybe, not only online, we'll see. Yeah, and I'm from Germany, mid of Germany, <laughs> forgot that. And I realized that some of us are very spring, spring, uh, coated <laughs> when yeah this is like woof <laughs> and the anemonia uh, they are really nice behind Heidi so I hand over to you Heidi yeah thank you uh, as for the European conference I was saying to to Christine California that I might go there too, because I have to go to Germany to get my passport renewed. And I just make a triangle and go over to Budapest with my car and uh, go there. So I really, I miss You can it. take me with you. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, we can meet. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Really good. And um, I might also find somebody where to sleep, where we slept with Mark together. So it might be a possibility. I was just thinking it is in 2018, I couldn't go because Mark was about to die. So 2016 was the last time. And I mean, this are six years now, that's amazing. And it was always so great. I mean, I went to South Africa for the, in 2019, that was great too. But you know, that has always been for me an inspiration to be on these, on these uh, events and to meet people. And this year, hopefully, it will be less um, less horrible from the outside circumstances than it would have been the last few years. So I, I hope that I will go and that I can go. As for my situation, it's I'm quite good. Uh, from last time, uh, we talked about the problems I had, which also came out of somehow over caring and then being disappointed when it is not um, seen. I had a nice session with a medium last Monday, a week ago, and this clarified for me so many things. And it was really, from then on, I was more, no, it, I, I felt a shift into positivity again, you know, and that was really, really, really great. I'm grateful that I did this and a friend told me about this woman and uh, I was crying the whole time, but I felt during the, during the um, session that it was shifting, you know, so I might need to learn something about overcaring and of maybe setting myself first without having um, be ashamed of doing so. <laughs> but coming back to the topic, it seems to be a f female topic. I mean, in history, we were the caring people, we had to, to put things straight in the family, you know, get the things together. So how far do we still need this to do this? Or sometimes I have uh, the suspicion that it's also 
uh, the characteristics of Enneagram too, no? That we think we do a lot for other people and then for getting something back maybe. So I, I would like to explore these things with you today. Where can we have a balance with giving and taking or as, also asking, not only taking, but asking for a return and a, a balance. So open to you. Heidi, I was wondering if you would be willing to let us know, did you work it out with the woman or did you just work it out for yourself in terms of, you know, you coming to peace with the, with the conflict with her? More or less first about myself, but the, 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 the waves have calmed down quite a bit. It's a different atmosphere now, you know, and that's good. And we still have to talk some concrete things for the future, but uh, after they come back, it will be so. No, it's, it's really, I, I, especially for the decision, no? when I was thinking to go with the other people to in this uh, project of uh, co-living in another place and selling my house. And this uh, medium, she said, when I asked what is my role in life and so on. And she said, you are doing your role in life and quite at the, at the place where your butt is sitting now, she said. <laughs> And I said, really here? Yes, she said, really here. And later on, she said it again. So it was for me very clear. She said, it's not time to leave the place, she said. And so for me, it's clear the decision. I don't, I don't decide to go away because she said, it's not the time uh, at the moment. So good. So one, one problem less to have to decide these things, you know. <laughs> okay, open to... Maybe, uh, Christine, for the Enneagram too, if you see a, a connection with the general women uh, situation and... Yeah, I certainly think um, the pattern too can be hooked into that in a, in a way perhaps that maybe some of the others wouldn't. Although my first instinct with this is anthropologically, look how we've evolved. Animals mothers taking care of children. And what we know about history, unless you know you were living in a castle and there were other people to take care of your children, what we know about history is that women have been caring for others. So I think we come by it pretty honestly um, and deeply. So I would, I don't think that the, you know, like type eight mothers are known as being the most protective. They're absolutely not gonna let anybody mess with their kids. Um, threes are gonna be encouraging their children to, to develop this way and develop that way and have this challenge. So I think each one of the numbers will be parenting and taking care of others, but in different ways, but I'm thinking it's much bigger because of the, our genetic strain. You know? um, so it'll have its subconscious too, this instinct to, to be caring and helpful. And we all show that in different ways is my experience working with myself and others. Do you have any questions? Maybe if I have been ambiguous about any of that, let, please ask me or clarify your version of it. Because many of you know something about the Enneagram also, not just not just me. Okie dokie then. <laughs> um, From, yes, Victoria. Victoria, you're muted if you wanted to speak. Well, I, this isn't about the Enneagram. So I, if we're just going on that line right now, no? Oh. I, I, I'm sorry, I'm still a little disoriented because I came in late. Um, <clears throat> the, um, I just wanted to say that the, the, it's, very, it's very, very relevant, this topic for me, because um, ever since my mother died, I've been working on, with, with a therapist on um, setting boundaries because um, my, I had no boundaries of any kind with anybody. I, I just went through half a century of trauma, but... Um, 
what has been really interesting that I just discovered the other day is, um, and I'm going to talk about further today with my therapist, um, that I, uh, in the last six months or so, I've finally been able to set firm boundaries with people who are abusive, who are demanding and um, and taking advantage um, and sort of the range I'd say from what you described, Christine, with trying to be um, amenable to everything and everybody, so everybody likes you and you know you 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 seem to be a um, you know a, a totally sympathetic member of the group. From ranging from that to what you described, oh, the other Christine, <laughs> the two Christines, um, about like literally being accosted by somebody. Um, and have having you know all of your boundaries violated essentially, um, so I've finally managed to sort of set up. Some, they're very frail embryonic boundaries, but I'm really, um, I, you know, I, I think I'm on the right path. However, um, what I'd love to hear people share about is that what I discovered just recently is that my boundaries of giving care and compassion and love to people have not been established. And so I, um, I'm falling into these traps of, um, of not having, not setting limits. And um, because that seems like a, such a positive thing, it seems like, and, and ironically enough, my mother used to call me out on that because she, my mother was totally devoid of compassion. I mean, she was, she was very loving in certain ways, but she didn't have compassion in that general sense that I mean it. And she used to um, say to me, don't, don't give people any, any of your time. They're going to eat you alive. And so when I tell her, you know, so-and-so called me and talked for an hour and a half about her problems and this and that, my mother would say, don't do that. Just hang up on those people. <clears throat> and I could never do it because I genuinely care and I have compassion. So, um, so those are, now I'm seeing those are the boundaries now I have to set up. I've, I've managed to set them up against the, the, the bad people, as it were. <laughs> <laughs> but not against the, the the loving needy people that I genuinely care about. So um, so that's sort of my situation with the caring part actually today. It's fascinating to read you speak about boundaries. I was just earlier in a session that my daughter and a friend facilitated earlier today about boundaries specifically in relation to the business world and to your profession. And so I was, it was wonderful because it was lots of young women that were present and to be present to that and to hear their experiences um, was quite fascinating because I mean, I'm just in a very different place than they are and to really be present to what they are struggling with in terms of boundaries. And now that was purely from a professional point of view, not on the personal level. So I love that you now also brought boundaries in here. And you mentioned the word needy. And I, for me, is there's such a thin line between codependency and the neediness that's related to that, that we can easily give too much and then becomes codependency. And then it's very difficult to break that cycle. Whereas for me, I, what I'm learning is, for myself, is that, firstly, yes, I must also have very clear boundaries and stand my ground on them, but also to be very cognizant that I'm not going over that line where it's when somebody's needy that I'm not there to save them because for me, that's not care. And that love is actually also allowing to care for others, but then to let, let them be free. So I think that's something that I'm busy learning as well, which is quite interesting because we're not used to it. And um, sometimes it takes some effort to become aware of it, that it's busy happening again, that we can break the cycle. And then how to do that without being cruel or or, um, but quite just honest, to just be honest about it and to say how we feel about it. And it doesn't really matter. It's not about the other individuals, it's about us being honest to our, with ourselves. So the self, the self honoring 
which is then more in integrity of how we respond to others. That we don't create that lifeline that they forever will hang on to and they will never become self-authoring and autonomous in their own lives. So I think that's there's a real thin line for that. Thank you, I'm complete. I was just reminded of, um, I've, I've been working in, um, in a midwife school, uh, uh, nutrition around birth and, and also in a folk high school. And I could see the mothers, um, like some mothers st uh, stopped nursing their babies because they, they got drained and couldn't do it anymore and uh, were so exhausted. And I could see and really get that they didn't care, take care of themselves. So they had a very chunky baby <laughs> and were skinny themselves. And, and, and so after three months or so, they were just done with it because this was like, it sucks me out and, you know, and, and then there were moms that were having fun nursing and they just had, yeah, taking good care of themselves or giving the baby to the father and going to a sauna or whatever. And, and they still loved to, to nurse them. So, so it's also like when something gets exhausting, maybe it's not about the caring itself, but about not caring about myself, not, not giving me what I need. And, and so there was one phrase I always said in, in those courses was like, if the mother is taking good care of herself with nutrition, with sleep, with everything, then the baby is well. So you don't have to always think of the baby first, but of the mother first. And, and for me, this is also resonating with what has been said. So um, I can give a lot more if I take care of myself. So it's, it's not the, the caring itself that's bad or too much or whatever. It's more the lack of caring for myself. So, and, and from the very beginning, <laughs> from motherhood. Well, that, that's what um, I call the oxygen mask syndrome that, um, not syndrome, but <laughs> um, that I didn't, I literally didn't understand it. And I traveled with Beatrice from the time she was um, two weeks old. And um, so we were flying every week. And I, in, until I started this, um, work with a therapist I literally never didn't understand the oxygen mask thing because I thought no way I'm not gonna let Beatrice you know die from lack of oxygen <laughs> forget about myself so it's yeah it's such a good point I think with mothers and children yeah and I find it very good point because we were educated not to take care of ourselves but to take care of others and you are not really important. And our mothers, at least mine, in many ways, she, she lifted as an example. And at the same time, I could notice that probably unknown to herself, she was the boss. She was uh, uh, sending around everybody else. And she had a lot of power, but she didn't know it. She felt like a, a victim. And this is a strange thing no? that we by the demand that we don't have to care for ourselves, then in some strange way, we care for others, but we don't care for others. You know what I mean? We are not, not, not completely there because there is a resistance which we are not uh, often maybe not noticing, and then the care gets in some way distorted. You know? And the education and this period after the war, I mean, it was still very much like, you know, like before, like you, you have to obey, you have to blah, blah. And, um, and you, as, a, as a girl, you have to do the things and you have to be kind. I found a letter of my father to me when I was 12 years old. And obviously I was somehow, somehow 
um, resistant to an to an adult. Um, obviously, I gave him words or something. I don't know who it was now. But the letter of my father said, "The klüger gibt nach, nach the the more um, the more uh, knowing person or the more how can you say that uh, uh, savvy." Yeah, most every person uh, will will see it, with uh, intending that a twelve-year-old girl should be uh, retreating and uh, and do it um, and give up the position towards uh, an adult person, you know. And when I read that, I thought, oh no, you know, <laughs> that's that's just not right. That you ask the twelve-year-old girl not to, I mean. To behave better than an adult, <laughs> and in this atmosphere, when you are grown, you have the feeling that uh, nobody cares about you, but you have to care about everybody else's needs, and your needs don't matter, no. So, I wonder if it was in America the same thing, and in South Africa and wherever, because we definitely, after the war, we had a, a, a particular situation, no. So it might be different in other countries. I had exactly that experience when I was about 12 years old that I, I still remember vividly. I mean, I remember the room and everything that um, my dad and two of my uncles were all in the same room. And, um, and I don't know where the women were, but nobody, I, was, I just was there because I like to hang out with them. And all of a sudden, um, I don't know if it was my dad or one of my uncles said, oh, can you make some sandwiches for us? We're hungry. And I just said, I said, no, I'm not going to make sandwiches for you. You make your own sandwiches. And I really got into trouble because all, you know, it was, it was it, all three of them were against me. And, and because they were all, um, you know, either married to, I mean, they were all married to my aunts who were all my mother's sisters. So I, I got sort of triply punished <laughs> when they heard the story. But I remember this surging up in me and I surprised myself because I was very shy and very meek for the most part, but I, I just, something in me with these three big men, big adults, one of whom was standing, I remember, near the refrigerator. It was kind of one of those kitchen dining room, you know, combinations. And I thought, why should I jump out of my chair and be serving them? But um, anyway, I never forgot it. <laughs> Well, Heidi, I think you, your example with your mother is really interesting because um, I think women have been told that to be caring is equal to be self-sacrificing, right? That the, that the value of being caring is not just in taking care, which should be enough, <laughs> but it's also to the extent that you're self-sacrificing. And, and so the theme I hear repeatedly is that what a shame that is because you know it makes you feel more, more like a victim or it makes you feel like it's not grounded, it's totally imbalanced. Um, and I think you know men are self-sacrificing also, but kind of in ways that we see as heroic. You know, they they conquer things and they they're they're more action oriented in their heroics. And it's viewed entirely differently than when women are heroic with caring. So I, I, it is it's just an interesting juxtaposition of those two things. And it, it's hard to reconcile. We get mixed messages a lot. I'm actually really grateful for my dad. At a very young age already, he asked me and my brother, we would go and do all his business for him in town. We were hardly 10. And it was like completely the masculine things at that time that girls didn't do those things. Not, not even my mom did it. When he passed when I was 17, my mom didn't know what to do, how to do anything. But with, with us as kids, he created that situation where we where, where we could that healthy masculine could we already were um, exposed to it at a very young age for myself specifically as a girl 
So I'm really appreciative that you remind me of that right now. And it's you, Victoria, who, who planted the seed. <laughs> because my dad, whenever he asked me to, when he was still alive, whenever he asked me as a young girl to make me coffee, I would say to him, how much are you going to pay me? And uh, he found it very you, you humorous at the time and um, would, set, would make a joke about it. But he did, he did actually... Um, he did respond in a, in a beautiful way about it. So he didn't, he didn't say to me, hey, just go make coffee. It was, it was like he was actually on that end, he was uh, res respecting me as a human being, not only just as a girl, which I do appreciate now. And thank you for reminding me of that. It must be really, really deeply ingrained in me all these, the things you're talking about, because all these stories about, no, I won't make the sandwiches or how much will you pay me? Or like, I'm, I'm having reactions against those of, of thinking, well, why not? <laughs> why can't you be kind and caring and do the thing? <laughs> anyway, I'm just noticing that reaction. I wanted to share that, that it's, it's it, yeah, it's very, it's very deep inside. And, and, and the moments when I, set my own boundaries. I mean, leaving these jobs is part of that. Um, and I was working, you know, all three of the people that I worked for in the nonprofit sphere were, you know, men in their 70s, 60s and 70s. And, and it was that kind of dynamic. Um, yeah. So anyway, it's, it's, it's something I'm definitely wrestling with and, and boundaries and, but but I feel so guilty and conflicted and weird when I actually say no or say, no, you know what? I need this or I need X, I need Y or I need space or I need time or I need whatever. I, it, it's, that's, that's very, it, I've gotten better at saying it and doing it, but the inner feeling accompanying it is uncomfortable. Well, Thank you very much, Beatrice, for sharing that. That's very important, I think, how far we women still have to work. Monia, I interrupted you. Yeah, um, I'm just trying to get the threads together. Um, maybe we just mix up showing my love uh, and being of service. I mean, uh, making a sandwich or making coffee isn't really self-sacrificing, so that's, <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's uh, with my husband now, we just uh, switch whoever does feel like doing something, does it. And it's not a self-sacrifice, it's just we enjoy doing or still being able to do that. And uh, so I, I go shopping and uh, I'm glad that I can move around and uh, it's not a self-sacrifice. To mix or to confuse compassion and the role of a victim, uh, Maybe that's one of the reasons uh, and people are dissatisfied with their role. If you enjoy making a sandwich or if you enjoy uh, making coffee, <laughs> um, I don't feel that I self-sacrifice by doing that. So I guess you really have to be aware of your how you how your, how your gut feelings are about a situation. And uh, I thoroughly understand uh, Beatrice that she wants to be a better person and does do, and self-sacrifice her, but I wouldn't advise it. I mean, it's, uh, you always say good friends and uh, even payment. So you just, uh, yeah. 
And at your age, Beatrice, you still you have to earn a living. That's a fact. It's to me at least that seems to be a fact. And I remember when I worked uh, at a at a paper, uh, writing articles and interviewing people. Uh, I don't know how I came to do that. Somebody promoted me and asked me to do that. And then when I noticed that this man never intended to pay me because I enjoyed myself so much doing it, I figured, no, thank you. And uh, I just cut it off. So uh, when it feels all right for you, that's okay. But if you really notice that somebody's taking advantage, um, you are not doing him a good thing if you accept it. Yeah, that's what I... Well, and it's, it's challenging too when there's other people out there who are willing mm. right and i think that's something that i was coming up against in, the, in these employment situations that there are a number of people who for whatever reason have the means to to just be passionate about it and to just volunteer or to get paid hardly anything or get paid really late or whatever and show up in, and work 24 seven on the projects. And, and I was trying to say, look, I can't do, if you're not gonna, if you can't pay me on time, I can't work, you know, I can't do this and I need to pay my rent and I need to pay my bills. And I also have other passions and things that I want to turn my attention and time to. And I'm certainly will show up and do the things you ask me to do, but, but I don't want to lie down give my entire life you know and energy and body and time and everything to your enterprise it's you know it's not isn't but i got accused of not being passionate and i got accused of not being committed enough and mm -hmm. not you know caring enough about about the work when they weren't paying, when, when they had agreed to pay me and then weren't paying me. And I was saying, look, there's a practical thing here also at play that I've had to get another job because I needed to pay rent. Anyway, that's just, but there's, but there's people, the problem is there's people out there who are willing to do that. And they don't talk about what, why they're able to do it. They don't, people don't talk about, they're not transparent about, oh, well, my husband has, you know, an, a very well-paying full-time job so I can do whatever I want with my time, you know, or whatever, right? I've had that my entire life as a musician that from, from my earliest memories, people asked me to perform for events and, um, and didn't want to pay me. And when I would say, well, you know, I'm a professional musician, this is my livelihood, they would say, yeah, but you, I know you play because you love it. You love music. So because you love it, you should just want to do it all the time. And I said, well, I, maybe I do want to do it all the time, but I also have to live. So it's, it's again that, um, that we actually, there's that confusion between, um, you know, like, like Jesus says in the gospels, the laborer is worthy of his hire, period, the end, that, that if you're doing something, it, you know, it's, it's, uh, I mean, to have those double standards is, is so, so tricky. And especially in the arts. I mean, I think Beatrice is coming up against the same thing, unfortunately, mm -hmm. when they accused her of not being passionate, yeah, they, actually, were, they were trying to- Yeah, um, manipulate her. It was like, it was like, you're an artist. That's why you're working for this nonprofit arts organization. And why aren't you acting like an artist and just like throwing yourself into the fire continuously because you believe in our cause, you know, it's, it's just a, it's a kind of manipulation and it's a lack of respect too. Cause I would say to doctor, but the, see that, but as when she said, there are other people that are out there. Um, the, the world is full of um, wealthy doctors, medical doctors who are amateur musicians. And of course they are thrilled to be invited to play for this reception or that reception or this yeah. event or that event. And, and of course there's, they're, you know, brain surgeons or whatever. So they don't have to worry about earning money as, besides which they don't play that well, but it's, it does create a problem. <laughs> well, you guys are familiar with the five love languages and one of them is acts of service. So I think it, it's 
entirely different. If you are generating an act of service out of a, a feeling of love, as opposed to being asked or expected to do an act of service, like make a sandwich, I think your uncles and your father just assumed because you care about them that you would sacrifice automatically. Uh, and it creates that hierarchy. I mean, it's a statement about who's in and who's out of the out of the clique or whatever. So it's, you know, acts of service are lovely and very loving, but the it's all about the intention, right? <laughs> like, where is it coming from? And is it being uh, coerced um, or, or given? Yeah. yeah. I really think touching on what I would call the underbelly of this conversation. And I think, Hanali, you said it perfectly, self-honoring. When we're self-honoring, whether we're a male or a female, we're doing it from a motivational place inside. We can call it intention or motivation. It feels clean and good and solid. So that term self-honoring is encompasses a lot of what I hear us talking about today. And thank you for that, that terminology. Um, one of my meditation teachers, he said people get love in a wrong way they give, 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 and then they are exhausted. And actually it's the opposite direction. You give it to yourself and then you can overflow. <laughs> and, and, but the, the direction should be like, yeah, self-love can create that overflow of love and compassion and service or whatever that might be. And if you don't have self-love and self-respect, self-honoring, then um, you get drained somehow. Money-wise, energy-wise, uh, honor, <laughs> honor-wise uh, in, in many different ways. Yeah, and to, to see what is um, like you should do like my father was like how on earth could a girl not want to clean her room <laughs> or whatever that might be so he had a very clear view on what girls want and have to and naturally uh do and boys completely different um so there is this this social like almost like an implant <laughs> that yeah that people say you should and why can't you or you're not compassionate enough or whatever this is their assumptions they are never checking i just want to share i know i'm talking too much today but i just wanted to share two quick gems that i heard in in my um during my addiction retreats. Um, one is um, uh, just yesterday, a man who was leading the retreat said, there's a difference between service and help. And he said, um, help means imply, he said it's, it implies a, a, a kind of power structure. And so it's not, it's not equal. And, um, and that's where you can get into trouble. But he said service, comes from the heart it's a voluntary thing and so it's it's actually affirming um the equality of the relationship and it's really interesting because i i just thought of service as being down below but the way he expressed it, he said that's you're given you have uh agency and so it makes it equal and then the other gem was from a woman the day before or maybe it was the same day <laughs> doing a lot of these things who said um remember when you're pouring always to take a sip of course i don't think that's very practical but but i like the idea of it that um that as you're pouring yourself out in service to others remember to basically to keep um nourishing yourself in the process or you'll or you'll pour it all out so those are my two little gems to pass on
I was thinking about the self-love thing and the self-honoring thing which we were talking about. Um, I don't think in our family I learned that. And I see many, many other girls who didn't learn that, but also boys. It's not only, only girls. So during life, then you try to, to sort of learn it. How, how well can you really learn it when at the beginning you get the message that's for the psychologists uh, among us, you get the message that you are not really good enough, not right, not uh, something because you don't behave in the way you should behave. For instance, you should do this and that and that and that, and then maybe you get some love. And <laughs> I was thinking about you, um, uh, Victoria, it happened to me all the time with singing. You, know? you sing in the church and you sing it for the for the glory of God, you know, and uh, Oh, you want money? Oh no, you know, that's God is so important that you have to sing for them. So uh, this is some distorted way of thinking what service is, in my opinion. And we somehow bought into that ourselves. So I still have struggled with self-love. I have to say there come many moments of, uh, <laughs> you know, so... Maybe you find some advice for me too, Victoria or Monia or whoever. <laughs> Christine. Well, maybe we could talk about self-love next time. Just self-love without pampering oneself, but giving yourself what's due. And this connects to what I thought when I did the introduction to today. When you pretend to love your child very much, you know, and to you, you the devouring mother practically, you no. Know? When you protect it from everything and every, and don't allow the children to develop themselves and develop self-love and self-confidence. We talked about self-confidence, uh, and many women think that this is love for their children, but instead they are hindering them to develop in a in a good way. So. Yeah, then this caring is over caring and it's more destructive than helping, isn't it? Well, what's interesting about that too is the, the self-love thing is we, we've all talked about parents or elders in our life that, that showed us what, it, not told us directly sometimes, but also showed us in their own life what it means to care or not care. And, and we learned, we learned to not self-love because they weren't self-loving. And so it, I think it's just like a reiteration of the importance, the oxygen mask thing, the importance of taking care of yourself, because then when you are taking care of the other, the other isn't mirroring your lack of self-love for yourself, right? That that it, it, it goes down generationally and it goes down from teacher to student and it goes, you know, that I don't know if that made sense. It made sense in my head. I don't know if I articulated in a way that made sense. I, I was trying to find a quote now that I saw a while back, which I shared with my daughter, but I can't find it right now. But it says something like this, that the friendly father keeps the young girl infantile. He doesn't want her to grow up. Can you say that again from the beginning? The, the, the friendly father, so the friendly caring father, the dad, keeps the daughter, the young girl, infantile um, because they don't want them to grow up. They want to be able to be their daddy forever, so to speak. And when I saw it at the time, it was it, it really made me think, you know, my dad was not like that, but it made me think a lot about, I've never looked at it that way. Because it, it, was, it was relating to where, um, especially the father figure, a strong father figure, uh, guides the way, um, or, the, or the provider and all those things. But on the other side, it was sharing this part of, I'll try to find it, then I'll send you, you ladies on email. 
but uh, so I don't share the whole quote now, but um, it comes from that point of view. And then that the friendly father, in actual fact, is trying to keep the girl, the young girl, infantile. He doesn't want her to grow up because he wants to be her daddy forever. And that for me was very interesting. It was a completely different dynamic that I've ever, I never even thought about that in that way. That it could be that. I'm not saying it is, but this individual wrote a book about it, and I will try to find the quote because for me it was very insightful. Now that you mention infantilization, uh, what does uh, the texting in WhatsApp with all these emojis? That's just infantilization. And uh, I have a, a girl a woman who, who will be now 81 and she sends about 10 emojis after ever having ever a message. And it's, well, I can't take her serious anymore. So there is the saying in the Bible that we should become like children, but it doesn't mean to be infant, infantiles, infantiles, infantilized, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> yeah. The just, only the only reason I accepted the gift of an iPhone was because I was envious of other people being able to send emojis. <laughs> I absolutely love it. I um, get strings. I get strings of I, my phone goes ding, 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 ding. And I'm like, well, what's going on? It's an emergency. And I open it. It's just my mother sending me 15 <laughs> emojis in a row. I will never text you, Monia. I'm glad you're in Vienna. <laughs> no, it does. It's okay. Uh, I reduced her. I said six emojis are enough. And she, <laughs> And she agreed because it just, uh, it didn't make sense to me. So, uh, yeah. Well, it's interesting though, the Asian, um, I mean, that would be a really interesting subject because um, I was thinking earlier anyway, when Heidi, when you were talking about the, the, the woman being the boss, um, you know, sort of behind the scenes and not, you know, not being recognized as such, but actually being the boss, that that's the whole Asian culture, that the women are totally subservient and bowing and scraping and carrying on. But actually, they're the ones that hold the purse strings and make all the big decisions. They're actually controlling the household. In it, and, they, and it's all kind of a, a front, this humility. But the Asian culture is, you know, invented the emojis, needless to say. And then all the, the Hello Kitty and the, um, and the Japanese women dressing up like, like Alice in Wonderland and... Um, I love it. I mean, that's what I love about, love about Japan. What can I say? <laughs> I need to click off right now. Um, that client is on her way. But I just want to say one thing that kind of does relate to the Enneagram, I suppose. When we think about whether or not we're in our healthy qualities or our less healthy qualities, it seems to me that our healthy qualities allow us to be self-honoring and to be respecting of others. But when we are in the less healthy qualities of our particular, when I call home base, which I don't like to hate the word type, um, our less healthy qualities, we're gonna be manipulating all over the place to try to make us feel better. But when we're in our healthy qualities, we're not manipulating. Our motivations are usually pretty generous and spontaneous in a place of awe or compassion as opposed to groveling around the ground to see where's some food that's gonna feed me emotionally or spiritually. So I'm a little heavy at the moment on that thought, but <laughs> having said that, I do wanna thank you all for this conversation. And um, I guess we'll find out what the subject is going to be next time, right? be surprised because there there seems to be lots of layers with this and thank you i so think prayer was, was in oh. the air already <laughs> all right self-care uh self-love was in the air already yeah yeah self-love yeah. yeah. christine I, I wish you good luck for your ex-gardener <laughs> 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 oh, you know, it, would, it, it, it would yeah it would scare me yeah mm. he's gonna be okay because he does have an, an airstream uh -huh. rv so he's got a place to live mm. uh -huh. and i've i've actually i'm a newcomer to this little community and i spoke with a woman today who's been here for 15 years and i told her a very confident she became like my therapist 
Mm -hmm. I told her my story and she said, he's been doing that for 20 years here. <laughs> you just didn't know it, honey. Uh -huh. Okay. I think we can wish him good luck too, but yeah. he's going to figure it out eventually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, He's in his 50s, so he'll figure it out. But thank you. I'll remember that when I... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Go have a wonderful time and i will not see you next time and then we'll find out how to how to deal with it and uh actually i i'm i'm so much looking forward to easter because my three girls are coming two are pregnant and one has two kids and they are all coming together so so they are like in 20s they are four weeks apart uh, in summer so it will be just sounds just like a fertility celebration <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> talking about caring <laughs> bye christine bye bye so we, i'm we, we didn't talk about uh christine's uh trying to please everybody in the room and neglecting her poor husband who can't stand up for himself uh so that's also a topic i would keep in the back of my mind yeah okay yeah it is a, a nice topic because i also had a situation where a husband of mine uh, was envious i would call it envious because i was uh uh, being with other people and didn't give him the normal time which I normally gave and so I'm wondering how far it is uh, your fault let's say Christine or is it is an expectation which is maybe um, not in the justified in the same measure as it might be i don't know so i i would like to explore that too so we have oh, we don't of... know this exact situation but i find it interesting as such yeah, totally it's your totally. husband priority yeah and where is the line between um like wanting to be a people pleaser and actually um yeah being myself and in contact so yeah, and this. wanting to be with people, no? Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, please yeah. Your like, like with most things, you know, there's truth in both. There's my truth and his truth, and they're both real. But, you know, it, it's finding that sweet spot between. That's important. When yeah. sometimes I wonder if, Sometimes I feel like being a people pleaser is like part of my identity. It's so, it's so deep, you know, you know what I mean? And maybe that's not the right way to put it. Like maybe what's part of my identity is, is being caring and compassionate and, and really having a big heart for people. Like maybe that's the better way to frame it, but the way that it comes out often is in the people pleaser mode. Um, so divorcing, well, like the other Christine was saying about the healthy and the unhealthy versions of, of who you are. One of my, my teachers, he said, so you are like this, you, you have this, you know, like, how do you want me to be? This way, this way, this way, or this way. <laughs> How do you want me to act and be? And and uh, and then I do this. So that's for me a people pleaser, somebody who who, who changes according to who needs what. <laughs> but isn't that also adaptability? I don't know. <laughs> Again, yeah, to a certain extent. <laughs> I know for me, till you don't not recognize yourself anymore. <laughs> well, sometimes it's like, I don't want to stick my neck out and say, this is what, because this was a weekend where we're all trying to decide what to do and there's no real plan. So we've got a lot of different people making suggestions. And so it's like, well, I, you know, I'll go along with what the majority wants to do because if I don't stick my neck out and be definitive, what if it's terrible and everybody hates it? <laughs> so I take that risk. And Tom's totally willing to put his neck out and say, you know, I think this is what's best. But 
you know, again, uh, risk taking, it has to do with a lot of things, Ris risk taking and flexibility and accommodating. It's, it's complicated. It's a lot of, a lot of layers. Well, also, I think the, um, I once saw a wonderful, um, it was actually a British comedy, but it was really profound. I never forgot it about truth. When is it, when is it actually hurtful to tell the truth? When, when do you have to um, conceal the truth in order to protect people so that you don't hurt them? And when, you know, it was, it was a very interesting sort of ethical question because sometimes um, to just blurt out the truth is, is intensely painful for other people and they're not ready to hear it. And it's better to keep quiet, you know, with what you know. I don't know. It's, it's, so that, that whole um, arena in terms of how we interact with other people, I think is really Com complex. The parents, the overprotective mother. I, I also know that uh, truth as a weapon, if it hurts, it isn't love. But uh, to feel that you know what the other will, what will be hurt with, it's uh, you're setting yourself higher up. You say, I won't tell her because she will be hurt. That's, that's also manipulative. Well, that's where it's tricky. I, I know that I learned that too, yeah. Mm. yeah. And sometimes you say a real friend is telling you the truth and doesn't, uh, and it's, it's not concerned so much about keeping you, you know, in, in, in cotton wool, but when there is the truth, it makes you grow, even if it hurts. Even Ken Wilber says no, uh, that uh, Compassion, idiot compassion, and idiot uh, compassion. The other compassion. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So we have I a lot of talk. Yeah, <laughs> sounds I, like I, grandmother, I just... grandmother Zen. It's also one of these words. Yeah, the, yeah. the pampering grandmother. Yeah. I I wanted to to say that if tr so called truth comes from um, like adrenaline from fight, flight, freeze. Um, then it's different. I think if it comes from an, a deeper place, that's completely different than when somebody says something and now I tell you the truth, uh, that that we, yeah, just uh, take the truth to punch somebody um, to, to rectify our uh, like, reflex in instead of just letting some time pass in between and come back and be a thinking being again so i i think what comes in the name of truth is not always the truth but just a reflex so there's more layers to that as well <laughs> many many topics to talk about and to yeah. sum up i think we have created the topics today so <laughs> Ladies, I thank you very much. It's always a real good, not only joy, but, but also inspiration and, and also insights. Thank you, everybody. And we we'll see you in two weeks. Ciao, ciao. Have a good Bye. time. Bye. And I'll make you coffee. You don't have to pay me. <laughs> <laughs> my dad, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an eternal teaser, so... <laughs> A lot of people don't know when you take me seriously when I'm really serious about it. But with my dad, it was always a joke. It did lighten up his time because he was he was a complete workhorse. Well, and that's the playfulness that Gertrude yes, yeah. encourages yeah. us to. Yeah. yeah. Make all of your coffee and tea. <laughs> bye bye. Bye bye. <laughs>